Coming up, a Minnesota nonprofit turned 70 and the Shinnecock's take on the cannabis industry. Plus, gun control is back on the table. I'm Mark Trahant, filling in for Leah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus the headlines from the ICT newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Thank you for joining us. We begin in New York State. The St. Regis Mohawk is supporting a state bill that would ban Native American mascots, logos, and names. This would mean that 113 New York schools would have to come up with new mascots. The bill was previously introduced in the state legislature last year. However, it didn't make it to the House or Senate floor for a vote. This bill is part of a growing movement to stop the use of Native American imagery in sports. Colorado, Connecticut, Nevada, and Washington State have all passed mascot ban bills. Studies show these mascots cause psychological harm to indigenous students. If the bill becomes law, schools will have until September 1st, 2024 to replace those mascots. Supporters say the bill is likely to pass. Citizens of Montana's Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes are celebrating a historic event. After more than a century of federal management and two decades of negotiations, the nation is reclaiming management of its bison range. The National Bison Range was created in 1908 within the tribe's territory, but without consent from the tribal government. This 19,000 acre preserve sits in the middle of the Flathead Indian Reservation. After the Montana Water Rights Protection Act of 2020 was enacted, the bison range was returned to tribal management. The animals within the range are direct descendants of those first managed bison herd in the Flathead Valley. A tribal citizen led a herd of orphaned calves over the range and back to the nation's territory, where they have flourished ever since. The weekend of festivities included a speech from Interior Secretary Deb Holland, who took to social media to share her experience. The nation officially took over on January 2nd of 2022. In Canada, sacred items belonging to a 19th century Blackfoot leader are being returned. The Chichiga Nation is receiving items that have been housed in a British museum for nearly 150 years. APTN's Ta Mar A Pententel has the story. It started with an emotional ceremony at the Royal Albert Memorial Museum in Exeter, England. This sacred regalia belonging to Blackfoot leader Chief Crowfoot will finally be making its way home to Siksika Nation in Alberta. It's been housed in the museum since 1878. We're very grateful to have these items to come back home. Um, you know, we, we not only see this as one event, but we do see this as a relationship building, collaborative efforts on ways that we can um, open the door to bring many more items back. Chief O'Reilly Crowfoot and a delegation from Siksika traveled to the UK for the ceremony. The regalia includes a buckskin shirt, leggings, a knife with feather bundle, beaded bags and a horse whip. Chief Crowfoot died in 1890. He was a prominent chief and respected leader in the Blackfoot community. He was one of the signatories to Treaty 7. Elder Herman Yellow Old Woman says he worked to have these items returned for over a decade. Then in 2020, Exeter City Council voted to give them back. Yes, they're not just items. They are uh, a living thing to our, to our people. I knew it was going to be emotional for me, and I know it was with, with the rest of the team that is here. For the delegation, the trip is also about building relationships. We want to continue creating these relationships with the, with the UK, 
uh, with the museums here, as they all hold uh, very special uh, um, items that belong to our, our ancestors and to our people. The regalia will return on May 25th and will be on display at the Blackfoot Crossing Historical Park near Siksika Nation. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. In Minnesota, the remains of an Indigenous person who lived 8,000 years ago will also be making their way home. A partial skull was discovered last summer by two kayakers in the state's drought-depleted Minnesota River. The remains were eventually turned over to a medical examiner and then the FBI. A forensic anthropologist used carbon dating to determine it was likely the skull of a young man who lived between 5,500 and 6,000 BC. Dylan Gotch is a cultural resource specialist for the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. In a statement, Gotch wrote that neither the council nor the state archeologists were notified about the discovery. This is required by state laws that govern the care and repatriation of Native American remains. The item has been turned over to the Upper Sioux community tribal officials to be cared for. And those are the headlines from the ICT newscast. Coming up, the Shindicock Nation invests in cannabis and tragedy puts gun reform back on the table. But first, a Minneapolis nonprofit celebrates 70 years. Stay with us. The Division of Indian Work will celebrate its 70th anniversary this fall. Founded in 1952, it's a mainstay in Minneapolis that provides services for Indigenous families and individuals. Joining us is Executive Director Louise Matson. Welcome, Louise. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Well, give us a bird's eye view of the second seven decades of the Division of Indian Work. Well, our um, agency was started back in 1952, as you mentioned, when um, the government policy was to urge our uh, Native folks to relocate to urban areas. And so um, folks were coming into Minneapolis um, with not a lot of resources. So Greater Minneapolis Council of Churches um, started Division of Indian Work in 1952 to kind of address those needs. And actually, our very first program was a food shelf, which we still operate to this day. Explain the, the, the name, Division of Indian Work. Well, I mean, the exciting news is in the course of the 70 years, we grew to establish our own board of directors, our own strategic plan, our own mission statement. And then um, in, in uh, 2016, we started our separation process from Greater Minneapolis Council of Churches and became our own 501c3, as well as, you know, truly autonomous Native majority board and native majority staff. So we are still a division of Indian work, but we are not a division of GMCC anymore. That's probably the next step on our journey is to rename our agency. But, you know, shortly after we formalized our separation in 2018, you know, we had COVID and also we had the um, uprising on Lake Street. And so we've been a little bit distracted. Um, but we are known as DIW um, in the community, you know, so it is, uh, you know, could we keep that acronym? We'd like to. I think it'd be a fun process um, to find a good name, but that's the Division of Indian Work, although we are no longer a division of anything anymore. Well, I, you mentioned the uh, uh, uprising, and I do want to ask you, we've just passed the second anniversary of the murder of George Floyd, and, and you're right in the heart of all that, so maybe talk about that for a second. Well, it was just devastating in our community. I mean, we as Native people understand and unfortunately deal with, you know, police brutality. Um, however, seeing our neighborhoods um, just destroyed the way they were. And, you know, it was a lot of outside people coming in. You know, I could see that uh, when we were at Lake Street. But what, I mean, we're on Lake Street and I could see the people driving by and different plates, um, out-of-state plates um, causing trouble. But what happened is, you know, American Indian Movement organized here in Minneapolis, and they would nightly patrol all around um, different agencies, um, Native and non-Native. 
and they protected us. There were people in this parking lot all night um, turning people away for about three days until the National Guard came in. And you know what? They're still, they still go out and patrol and um, keep us safe. Um, so it was a horrible experience and our neighborhood is still recovering. A lot of burnt out buildings, um, but we, uh, we survived thanks in a large part to our own community protecting, protecting us. Where do we stand on reform in that area, particularly with the police? It's, you know, we've had a problem in Minneapolis with policing for a long time. And we do have some wonderful um, police officers that work well in community. And we have some wonderful Native police officers. But we've also had um, some uh, police officers that have been around even since the 80s, um, you know, that um, should not be police officers anymore. And I don't think we've made a lot of progress in reform in Minneapolis. Um, I know we haven't, um, and it's unfortunate, but uh, we need um, police officers that are do community policing that are truly peace officers and that are from the community. One of the things you're known for is innovation, particularly with child services. Maybe talk about that a bit. Well, we, uh, you know, we have a really strong, um, particularly maternal health program where we do a lot of home visiting, um, a lot of uh, curriculum that's native focused, like the family spirit curriculum that was piloted in, in Indian country. And we use that. Um, and then we have support from, you know, Hennepin County and foundations like Casey Family Programs to work directly with young moms and young dads to try to keep them out of, out of the system. You know, we once again have high disparity rates, um, I think because of what happened during COVID and people losing their support systems. So we do um, a lot of culturally focused work. Our youth programs um, been around since the 80s and it is all about culture and culture is prevention. Um, I think the, the wonderful beauty of being in Minneapolis is the diversity of our tribal nations, but that can also be a challenge when you're trying to do language work and cultural work because we share a lot of commonalities, but we also have a lot of differences. We have less than a minute left, but I want to ask you about the challenges you face now coming, especially as the pandemic changes. Well, um, you know, I think right now it, it is still the, the pandemic, trying to come out of the pandemic. We've always been open. We've, uh, you know, our food shelf was giving out food through the garage, trying to get back to normal, but trying to keep people safe because we're still, we're highly vaccinated in Indian country, but we still have high mortality rates. So we still have to work with how do we make people safe and comfortable with groups? That's probably still our biggest challenge is um, what's our new normal after the pandemic? We'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Miigwech, I'm happy to be here. Last week, we had an opportunity to interview many of the tribal leaders at the Res 2022 conference in Las Vegas. Shirley Snavy sat down with Shinnecock tribal member, Shanae Bullock. She's managing director for the tribe's cannabis business called Little Beach Harvest. Let's take a look. So you've done a lot of things in your young life, I want to say. Um, but one of the things that uh, I'm really proud of you is that uh, you are a CEO for your tribe of the cannabis industry. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, um, it's, it's really an honor to um, you know, be like a, a, a CEO, but really a business leader for our tribe. You know, one of the amazing things I'll have to say about our community, which is the Shinnecock Nation, right in Long Island is we've always been um, economically sustainable, whether that was through whaling, oysters, trade, um, and so cannabis being an industry that we are reclaiming, I'm so proud to really be in there just to make sure that we're not being left out of the overall industry. And so let's talk about that overall industry. Do you know how many tribes are doing this cannabis industry? You know, not off the top of my head. Okay. 
Um, I know that there are so many throughout the country, and again, each state has different, different relationships yeah. with different tribes. Um, we, in our community, in our tribe, we have our own laws that we've passed, so we have our own licensing. So we don't need a license from the state of New York to be able to enter in the industry. Um, but we're looking to be able to do business to business and trade with other tribes um, within the state, but also outside of the state of New York. And that's interesting that you talked about trade because I know that your tribe, like my tribe, trade was just really an important way to get things done. And one of the things that I'm seeing here at this conference is, you know, let's take a look at those old ways that we used to trade and we used to share um, and recreate some of those trade routes. Yes, and I think that that's actually something that we're talking about within our own community, but I'm also hearing that being discussed with the other tribes in the state. Now the challenge is recognizing those trade routes. See, we might be recognized as federal tribes or state tribes and sometimes historical tribes, but our how we operate isn't always recognized. You know, how we trade with one another isn't always recognized. And so that's really the challenge, but it's really going to take us coming together and just practicing those customs once again and coming together um, to do that. I think you said you're one of 7% of women in the cannabis industry that are one of the only CEOs of 7%. What, what's that like? So, um, well, I have to say, I mean, it, it's not a secret that the cannabis industry is, you know, essentially kind of controlled by non-people of color um, and usually uh, also not women at the top of that. And so when you see the cannabis industry, and I walk into the room as a CEO, um, I'm not always met, I will have to say, with the same understanding or respect that the other CEOs would. Right, because um, there's sometimes there's this understanding that women are there to be the creatives, usually the administrators, which we're amazing at, but we can do all of that and still lead a, a, an enterprise. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of eyes that are now being opened because they did. There is a statistic, and it could have changed since last year, but um, about seven percent of the women in the industry are CEOs of the overall industry. So as a woman of color, being African American and Native American, that's a that's an even smaller percent. <laughs> so why uh, why did the tribe decide to get involved in the cannabis industry? Well, I mean, cannabis is something that our tribe has always been a part of. You know, um, I, I have stories of my grandfather. You know, um, and my my grandmother talks about this story all the time that you know he harvested and grew his own cannabis for his own personal use. Um, and utilize that uh, for the community when they needed it um, and harvested it and, and processed it um, and didn't really sell it um, but utilized it for us and had trade with it and so that's just my personal story as a Shinnecock woman but there are others within the, the community that have similar stories um, and so now that we're also seeing an emerging um, industry like many other industries that are being created um, we do not need to be left out of something that we've been doing for so long. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a way for us to really pioneer, um, but it's also something that's important because you have a lot of people that are incarcerated, people of color that are incarcerated for this sacred plant that are not allowed to be a part of the industry because they're considered felons. But here it is, an industry that you're being able to profit off of. Then there's also the reason that the opioid crisis and other pharmaceuticals that have um, really um, damaged, you know, our, our people. Not only just the person that has, um, you know, been a victim of it, but the families as well. And so here is a sacred plant that we want to be able to heal our community, but also develop sustainable um, uh, structures for our community to be able to do business to business with tribal members um, and others. Well, thank you, Sinead. Thanks for taking time to sit with us at ICT News. Yes, thank you so much for having me.
The House Judiciary Committee is taking up wide-ranging gun control legislation after a number of mass shootings in America, including at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, where 19 children and two teachers were killed. Regular political contributor John Tasuda joins us. Welcome, John. Thanks, Mark. Always great to have these conversations. So once again, the nation is grieving over lives lost in a mass shooting, and there's a partisan divide. Is there um, an opportunity for real change this time? Well, um, so it looks like, the, even from inside discussions, that they're going to take a serious crack at it. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess, you know, yes, what's the saying? You strike while the iron is hot. Um, so the, you know, the issue is fresh and hurtful. Uh, to people. So I think, um, you know, the folks who are in the middle who are trying to forge this, uh, you know, compromise, uh, see this as their best chance, uh, probably true. Um, as you know, they've, they've come close a number of times in decades, but never been able to, to get something over the finish line. It's interesting when you look at this globally, because when New Zealand had a mass shooting, they immediately took steps. And now Canada, which hasn't had a major mass shooting, has already taken major steps. And it just shows the difference in our political system as much as anything. Right. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, you know, dis uh, discussion, an interesting uh, you know, comparison. So Australia is another one. Um, Canada and Australia are two that have sort of similar cultural histories to us. Strong hunting backgrounds, uh, strong pioneer backgrounds, you know, uh, families who grew up. Uh, you know, in in the in rural areas, you know, who's had guns, hunted, all this, you know. Uh, so they have this great history. Um, but the two things that Australia and Canada don't have that we have is anything enshrined in a constitutional, uh, you know, language that that provides sort of, uh, you know, in our case, anyways, a stronger personal right to these things. Well, in fact, the Canadian Constitution, where ours is about individual liberty, their top priority is public safety. And it's part of their constitution. You know, they have a strong British, stronger British history, even though, you know, we have British history ourselves. But um, a lot of those, uh, you know, ideas about uh, community value, safety, those things that the Britons have, uh, the, the Canadians have those to a large degree as well, sort of in their cultural history. So like many in Indian country, I grew up in hunting families and, and weapons were always a big part of it. But what's interesting to me is how you take that uh, cultural narrative and transfer it to an urban area where there's a very different mindset. And I remember a cousin of mine who worked in an emergency room said, if you work in an emergency room, everything changes. <laughs> oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. But how do we t t how talk about it in that context of a rural culture versus an urban culture? Um, <clears throat> well, so, you know, I think that's one of the things that they're trying to address with this compromise is, um, you know, to preserve what people see as a, a really important part of American cultural history, regardless of your background. Um, but at the same time, do we really need to have you know, assault weapons, military uh, style weapons available in urban areas as well as rural areas. Um, you know, that that's a question open for debate. And if you and if you really step back and look at American history, you look at at, at the West, you know, Dodge City, let's say. Right. Um, you know, the, the American history was really strong on gun control when you were in a town like that, as opposed to being you know out in, in the in the wild country, you know, so. Uh, it's, I mean, we have an interesting history, um, and the whole idea of the personal rights of firearms is a relatively new, um, you know, sort of uh, development, political development, uh, you know, in our country. I, I want to switch gears in our last couple of minutes and talk about politics. We've had a couple of primary, uh, key primary elections, and uh, former President Donald Trump has had a list of people that he's wanted, and he hasn't been all that successful. Uh, it's been a mixed bag of results. Uh, you're right. And uh, it's interesting, you know, um, you know, as Americans, you know, we tend to have short memories. And even somebody like Donald Trump that you know, was, was uh, you know, made such a, a presence himself, uh, you know, in, in a few short years, uh, you know, and it, it depends on where you're located. But, uh, you know, it, it seems to have less of an impact. And, uh, and then again, I think people always forget when you move from congressional election, or from, from House elections, to Senate elections, which are statewide, it's much harder for an endorsement like that to have an impact. Um, there's just a much bigger, uh, you know, uh, set of electoral votes there. Uh, whereas with the with the House districts, they're more compact. They tend to be more sort of ideologically similar, 
and so an endorsement, uh, you know, by by a former President Trump or or by any other you know figure tends to have a bigger impact than those. Well, well, in fact, in Georgia, where he had two candidates he really wanted to see go down, both won their primaries. And that that's a very good example. And and he's hugely popular in Georgia. Uh, you know, which, so that's an interesting. But again, you know, on these statewide elections. Uh, people tend to think about their own uh, state, and I think they 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 make their own decision ultimately about who's going to be the best governor, the best senator, et cetera, for their state. One state that's going to be fascinating is Wyoming, where uh, the candidate he's opposing has a ninety three percent record of voting with him. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that's very personal there. Exactly. Um, thank you, John. It's always great to talk to you. Uh, love talking these talking uh, on these uh, issues with you. Thanks, Mark. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For more news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. I'm Mark Trahant. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run.